talk, and they gave me 20 minutes to talk about basically one disease plus two others, and they give me 20 minutes to talk about um, three diseases. And as the introduction so kindly said, organic acidopathies is really where my specialty lies. So, so I'm going to talk about the definition of organic acidopathies. I'm sure you're familiar with this. And then I'm going to talk about how do we think about organic acidopathies, how do we diagnose organic acidopathies, and then how can we treat them. And the organic acidopathies, as many of you know, is a huge category of things. And it's absolutely based on the structure of the molecule. We're really going to talk about the, sy the systemic organic acidopathies. We'll go back to this slide. This is another one of those pathway slides that we all want to say overload. But I think what's important with the organic acidopathies, particularly the systemics, is initial treatment is entirely the same when you're presented with a patient with these disorders. They can, they can look like a liver failure with hyperammonemia, and we'll talk about why that's the case. So let's start out with an amino acid. We all are familiar with amino acids, and we talk about them as the building blocks of protein. But let's remember what an amino acid is and what parts it has so that we can talk about organic acidopathies. Because by definition, all organic acidopathies are, are defined by this organic component of an amino, an amino acid. And then you also have this amino component. So an organic acid is the, the carboxyl group attached to a carbon. And it's really important because the diagnostic of organic acidopathies look for this but also look for a, a carnitine bound to it, and that's the basis of some of the diagnostics. So we've got systemic organic acidopathies that I'm going to focus on, but let's not forget that organic acidopathies, there's two other types, and they're less likely to be seen with liver dysfunction. The first type is the ketogenic and ketoglytic. These folks present with hypoglycemia. So they present with intermittent hypoglycemia, and they have inappropriate ketones in their urine. And then the, and the third group is the cerebrals, and the classic of this is gl uh, glutaric acidopathy. These individuals present with what looks like strokes and macrocephaly. So, diagnostics of organic acids. We're really looking for the organic acids. We're looking for them in blood, and we're looking for them in urine. And what happens is that organic acid often binds a CoA which then gets replaced by a carnitine. So in blood, we're looking at the carnitine attached to this carbon compound. And so when we talk about it, uh, things that have propanyl carnitine, that just means there's three carbons attached to the carnitine and gives us an idea what the precursor organic acid is. We can also see these acids in urine, and classically it's done by urine organic acids. And again, going back to this pathway, I talked a little bit in terms of tyrosine. Anemia, we're looking for the toxins, and in some cases, we're looking for the deficiency. And most of the systemic organic acidopathies can have an element of hyperammonemia. And this becomes a clinical, or clinical therapeutic issue. So, as I said, the systemic organic acidopathies all get treated about the same way. It's just the specifics that differ. So the goal is to prevent and reverse catabolism, so we're not releasing a bunch of amino acids into the blood, accumulating toxins. We want to limit the amino acids that cause problems. This seems pretty practical. We're going to remove the toxins, and we do this by a series of things. Everything's from carnitine to scavengers. And then we're going to replace what we don't have. I think if you look at the pathway, you can see that that's really how therapeutics should work, because that makes total sense. And again, we're going to suck up the extra water and replace the water we don't have. So let's talk about the systemic organic acidopathies. There's really two big categories. There's a lot of little ones, but two big categories. We've got the proponent pathway and isovaleric acidopathy. The proponent pathway includes propionic acidemia and methylmalonic aciduria, and isovaleric acidemia is a different pathway. Both of these present with metabolic acidosis and hypermonemia, and that is what is life-threatening in the acute issue. They also have some long-term complications. What really happens
happens, though, is most of these individuals present with elevations in ammonia. And for many of you know, when you see ammonia elevated in a neonate or a young child, you're really thinking about the urea cycle. Now, how can an organic acidopathy look like a urea cycle defect? Well, as you know, the urea cycle has five enzymes, one cofactor, two transporters, has elevations in ammonia, and decreased urea nitrogen. What happens is the toxins of the organic acid actually inhibit the urea cycle. So you get secondary urea cycle dysfunction. So let's talk about IVA, isovaleric acidopathy. This is a leucine pathway disorder in which the block is at isoveryl CoA dehydrogenase, leading to accumulation of isoveryl CoA and two oxo isocaprolic acid. Individuals can present many ways. Some have no presentation at all, they do just fine. But during illness, they can have a decompensation that has hyperammonemia and metabolic acidosis. Their laboratory is classic by looking at the toxins and the carnitine bound to the organic acid. Now, this is an example of symptoms. This first gen man had a hyperammonemic crisis from a metabolic decompensation at three years of age during gastroenteritis. He's totally devastated. He wasn't diagnosed for about three weeks. He um, clearly has intellectual disability, a se severe uh, cerebral palsy. This is his sister. She was actually diagnosed at work because we knew what he had. She's totally normal. She's normal intellect, normal school, has no fairly aggressive when she gets sick, because you know she can get very, very sick from hyperammonemia. But this is the reason why we treat individuals, and this is part of the reason this is the, one of the newborn screening disorders in the United States. So our goal with treating these individuals is reverse catabolism and remove the toxins. So reversing catabolism makes a lot of sense. If you're sick, we treat individuals with dextrose-containing fluids so that they're not breaking down muscle. Removing the toxins in IVA, we can use carnitine and glycine and get normal, and we get enough toxin removal. And that's about it. In fact, we don't have to limit their protein content too much because many individuals don't require that. And this would explain why individuals with IVA have a variable phenotype. They may have no phenotype. They may never present a metabolic acid crisis. They may also not have any environmental pressures. Or they may have a devastating phenotype, and we can see this phenotype in both of our patients. So the hyperammonemia caused it, or is caused by an IVA by inhibition of the first steps of the urea cycle, and consequently, if you keep the toxins down, you don't you don't increase the hyperammonemia. If you prevent the breakdown of amino acids and a metabolic decompensation, you don't have the hyperammonemia. But you can also use medications to scavenge hyperammonemia when you see it. Let's move on to the other big metabolic, uh, metabolic systemic organic acidopathy. This is the propanate pathway. It's defined by coming down and breaking down to propanyl CoA. The amino acids and other things that make up propanyl CoA are the C vomit pathway. That's cholesterol, valine, odd chain fatty acids methionine, isoleucine, and threonine. And for those of you who know enough English, um, the, you see a lot of vomit in the propanate pathway disorders. Um, these individuals present with metabolic acidosis and hyperammonemia. They're more severe in general than the IVA individuals. And there's multiple enzymes that, are, that play a role. You can have the propanyl-CoA carboxylase or the methylmalonyl mutase, a cobalamin A and cobalamin B as a component. The laboratory is defined by looking for that organic acid in blood or urine. So you see propanyl carnitine, methyl citrate, which is one of the toxins, 3-hydroxypropanate, which is one of the toxins. And clearly, if your inhibition is at the methylmalonyl CoA mutase, or the cobalamin A and B, you accumulate methylmalonyl or methylmalonic acid. And so you'll see it in a minute. So let's talk about a propanate case. So this is a young lady who presented at two days of life with decreased appetite at about 12 hours. And everybody kind of blew her, blew her mother off when she says she's just not latching. And then she became more lethargic. 
And then she got cold, as in very cold, as in about 35 Celsius. And then she started to vomit. And then she got more and more sleepy. So the outside laboratory uh, did a number of labs. And the pH of 7.27, but clearly a metabolic acidosis with a bicarbonate of 6, uh, had a base axis and had an ammonia of 841 micromoles per liter. They have, she also had three plus ketones, so neonates should never have ketones, and it's usually a marker of a metabolic disease or other dysfunction if you're spilling ketones in the urine. Her lactate was normal, which told us the metabolic acidosis was not coming from lactate. So she got transferred to our hospital, hospital on D10 with electrolytes at one and a half maintenance. And the reason we choose this is this is a glucose delivery of six to eight milligrams per kilogram per um, minute. And she was also on sodium phenyl acetate and sodium benzoate um, because we couldn't get her onto dialysis during the transport. The transport usually takes about an hour, 10, hour and a half from this particular institution. She required dialysis to drop her metabolic acidosis and because of her hyperammonemia. And she recovered and we put her on a metabolic diet that avoided the C vomit pathway of compounds. At presentation, she had an extremely elevated C3, an extremely elevated 3-hydroxypropanate and methyl citrate, and she also had MMA. So her diagnosis is MMA. She's doing well. She's now seven. I saw her in the clinic last week, um, and she has not had as, as severe metabolic decompensation. She did have some, comp uh, some complications of her first presentation um, so it's not intellectually intact, but does well. So what are some of the long-term complications in these disorders? Well, so you can have these metabolic decompensations and metabolic strokes. These are energy strokes, not bleeding, clotting strokes. You develop eye disease. You can have arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies. These are com more common with age. We're not totally sure why that's the case. We can have renal dysfunction. Again, this accumulates with age. You have myopathies. There may be an increased risk for insulin-dependent diabetes within this population, and many individuals will have learning differences. The hyperammonemia that's seen in PA and MMA is, again, inhibition at the first few steps of the urea cycle. And oftentimes, these individuals will be placed on the nitrogen scavengers that you usually do with, um, that you usually use in the urea cycle. There's also an additional nitrogen scavenger that's particular for the propanate called car carboglumic acid. It is not approved for PA and MMA in the United States, although it's used internationally. So again, how do we treat PA and MMA? Well, we, we prevent and reverse catabolism. We limit the amino acids that they can't have through a very strict diet. We eliminate the toxins, and we use carnitine, and we may use these nitrogen scavengers. And then we replace the components they may not have. So the MUD enzyme is, uh, for MMA is actually a B12 responsive enzyme. And so in some cases, you'll have individuals who are B12 responsive. The particular case I presented is not B12 responsive. We may be able to use some anaporitic compound replacement using bicitrin. Recent studies by Longo et al. shows that this might be a case. And this is replacing the things that are downstream, so your inability to make some of the Krebs cycle intermediates. And then we use liver and kidney transplant. And so these are some good references for, proto for protocols you can use. And I'm going to touch through these. Um, and so the and for those of you who um, just didn't get a picture of this, uh, the two publications, if you just search my name and propionic acidemia, you'll probably get them. Um, this is my email. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I have five minutes left, which I was hoping I would have, because I want to tell you about something really excited. exciting. So I said that for the propanate pathway, we may do liver and renal transplants. About three years ago, we had a number of individuals that were being treated for propionic acidemia and methylmalonic aciduria with liver transplants. Um, and this was with a goal to decrease their hypermonemia load, decrease their overall acid load. Now, liver transplant does not cure the disease. Individuals still get a number of the long-term complications. 
However, they seem to have a better outcome in terms of intellectual function. However, when you take a liver out of an individual and give them a new liver, usually the liver coming out of a metabolic patient is medical waste. We thought this was kind of silly. So we worked with some collaborators and said, well, how do we, if we take this liver, can I actually learn something about this disease? And so, for those of you who are familiar, when you take liver transplant and you take out that liver and you just try to put it on a regular culture dish, it becomes a fibroblast. It loses all of its metabolic function as a liver cell. And that's not useful because I need to be able to show that my liver acts like a metabolic liver disease. And in this case, it looks like a propionic acid liver. So we worked with some collaborators in a company called Hemisher in Charlottesville, um, Virginia, which is about three hours south of Washington, D.C. And they had some technology that we thought was really cool. So we take the liver transplant out. We isolate the hepatocytes, and then we use this Conan, Conan plate technology. And what we've discovered is this Conan plate technology, because as you all are familiar, a liver cell has multiple ways to move, to move substrate around. You're able, to, you're able to have blood flow this way, but you also have movement this way. So their Conan plate technology allows us to put the hepatocytes on the bottom with some macrophages and cellate cells and allows us to move, move uh, uh, substrate around. And in fact, they actually start looking like usual liver cells. So this is actually our first PA liver patient. Her name is not Stacy. My collaborators like to name all our liver cells after a person. Um, so you may see that. I think I've taken most of the, uh, their names off. Um, but in any case, so this is her HME, and then this is her in, in, the, in, the, in the system. And so this allowed us to recapitulate propionic acidemia in a method that we could actually tech for, is we could actually use for um, therapeutic options. And so this again is, is a different patient, but this is HME, and then days in the days in the device, and as you can see, we start to make bile, we start to organize like a liver, and in fact, the biochemistry recapitulates the functional liver. We make albumin, our cytochrome P450s all function, and all the organic acid stuff, including secondary inhibition and urea cycle actually works in this culture system, which had never been done before. So they have all the normal biochemistry. And this is just looking at Propanil, or propanil carnitine versus acetyl carnitine. So the blue is normal, the red is somebody with PA, and there's actually two livers in this study. And the diagnosis, if you'll remember, is propanil carnitine in individuals with propionic acidemia. And this is a log scale. And if you look at acetyl carnitine, you get exactly the same. If you look at the level of propanil carnitine, the PA patients, have extremely higher levels than the normal patients. And if you look at the diagnostic ratio of C3 to C2, you have a significant improvement in terms of the amounts. And so that has allowed us to actually look for therapeutics for PA. And in fact, we've identified a, a number of chemistries that we're currently in, test, in um, testing to determine whether or not we can actually treat this very difficult disorder to treat. But we suddenly have a model for hepatic liver disease for inborn errors, and currently are working with other transplant centers around the United States to isolate hepatocytes, recapitulate additional models. We have models for maple syrup urine disease. We have models for propionic acid, obviously, for methylmalonic aciduria. Other things are less transplanted within the United States. I think we have a single tyrosinemia. Thank you.